invited talk and this very, uh, uh, this, this place, very exciting conference. Thanks to the organizers for organizing this meeting. I'm going to talk about um, particle pair diffusion, uh, in particular, a new theory since Richardson's original theory in 1926. And uh, I work in Saudi Arabia, King Fahad University, uh, in the Department of Mathematics. Let me begin by uh, this is going to be basic outline of my talk. I'm going to go over some of the classical theory that is based on Richardson's locality for pair diffusion. And then I'm going to uh, sort of introduce my new uh, non-local theory and uh, then present some results from uh, simulation method results and then conclusion. So let's have a part one introduction, Richardson's locality. Now, first of all, let's just talk about just a few snapshots of turbulence. As we know, uh, we're all practitioners of turbulence, very, one of the most complex sciences that we know of. And it's a kind of a mixture of, uh, uh, of, 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 of statistical picture together with coherent structures and so on, and a lot of exotic details. And that has consequences, particularly for uh, diffusion. Uh, on the right is uh, some classical uh, result. These are actual particle. Um, a part of trajectories from Van Dot way back in 1984. So one of the big questions in turbulence is how does turbulence diffuse particles? Now, in 1921, we have the famous Taylor's theorem um, for one particle diffusion. That's kind of pretty well known. But uh, there was a second famous paper, 1926, by Richardson, in which, in which he addressed not one particle, but two particles. So. We have the one particle theory of Taylor, 1921. But then we have, say, pair diffusion, like that. And how do these, in turbulence, how does this? So this is called pair diffuse. This is one particle, and this is two particle. So Richardson, this is 1926. And Richardson more or less pioneered this, theory, uh, this, 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 this uh, field of pair diffusion almost single-handedly. And later on, of course, uh, this was all that theory was embedded uh, within Kolmogorov's K41 theory. Now, K41, of course, uh, pertains to the inner, inner range of turbulence. Let's assume that this is a turbulent spectrum. Most of the energy, of course, is contained in the large scales by quite a long way. This, this may contain only a fraction of the, all the energy in the turbulence. But of course, we know we have epsilon rate of energy dissipation. There's a kind of cascade process, randomization. So uh, in this inertia, inner inertial range, which is also far from uh, viscous dissipation, we can assume uh, it's statistically stationary. It's homogeneous and isotropic, so which allows you to do a lot of scaling arguments. You have the famous five-third spectrum. Of course, this is, this is after 1926. Uh, Richardson had no knowledge of this as such. And the questions, the key questions we want to address um, is what governs pair diffusion process? And in particular, what uh, roles, if any, do local, local and non-local processes uh, play in the diffusion process? And in particular, the importance of in, uh, intermittency and also related problems of how do you actually model these things? Uh, theory is one thing, but we'd like to be able to simulate these things. That's another important issue in itself. So let's go back. So let's go back to, uh, to first principles. Let's go back to Richardson, 1926, in which the very classical paper. It's nearly 100 years, in fact. It'll be uh, uh, 19, 2026. Will be a famous uh, centenary of this famous paper. And what Richardson did was he collected a, a number of data from various sources, mostly from geophysical sources like volcano ash, spreading of volcano ash, and uh, balloons in the atmosphere. And he plotted this data, and he presented uh, the, the pair diffusion theory in the form of the what's called the uh, pair diffusion uh, diffusivity. This is not the one particle diffusion. This is the literally the uh, pair diffusivity, relative diffusivity associated with pair diffusion. And what he said is consider, well, consider this picture here. At any particular time, this is, the, this is your pair separation, as it were. And he made a number of bold uh, hypotheses. Uh, one was that he assumed that the pair diffusion itself 
is scale dependent. So L here is the modulus of the pair separation. And but actually there's a second important, a uh, couple of other important uh, hypotheses embedded in this. One is that he assumed that there was a single power law that governs the entire pair diffusion process on all scales. In other words, uh, this power here is a single power. A priori, there's no reason why you shouldn't have the power itself should depend on L, but he made the hypothesis that it should be a single power. And the, th and the next hypothesis, he actually gave a number to this, which is four thirds, in which he obtained kind of guessed from the data. This is where the data came in. And actually the four thirds, I'll show you in a moment, this is actually equivalent to a locality hypothesis. He didn't use the word locality in those days, but it's it is actually equivalent to locality in a way that I'll show you, very, very easy way of showing it. So this is the basis of, uh, of uh, Richardson's locality theory. Now why should the pair diffusivity be scale dependent? Well, it's not that difficult to see why. If you have a very small separation of particles, then the energy at that scale is gonna be small, so the rate of separation is gonna be small, but if pair separation is that much, then you have bigger energy containing. So it's not unreasonable to hypothesize that the pair diffusivity should be scale dependent and in fact it should be an increasing function of separation. So long, the other thing, uh, well, let's go on. So this is uh, Richardson and let me just show you, now it's very important actually to understand what you mean by locality because there's a little bit of a issue as, as to what you actually mean by locality. Locality definition I use is that um, something is local the pair separation process is local if the further increase in that separation depends only upon energies that are contained in energies of that size. A little, you have to think about it. In other words, in fact, uh, if, you go, if you now anticipate Kolmogorov 41, you know that energy content in, 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 in energies of that scale is given by the minus five thirds law. And from this we can uh, get, obtain a scaling for the pair diffusion directly as being proportional to L times U of L. U of L is just proportional to square root of L, E of L, and that gives you immediately four thirds, which is what I said. That, oops. Yeah. So this four thirds in, is in fact equivalent to a locality, which is actually quite remarkable, because in doing so, Richardson was actually anticipating Kamagorov, K41. Uh, 16 years later, so we could almost say Richardson uh, predated Kolmogorov rather sort of in a roundabout way. But it is actually very important to note that uh, this kind of argument does actually anticipate K41 16 years ahead of its time. And in fact, in, K4, in 1941, Obukov also showed that this four thirds, which is, in which is the power law for the pair diffusion, is actually equivalent to um, the pair separate, that's so called T cube law. And together, these two are known as the richardson obukov uh, regime, uh, locality regime. Uh, lo in fact, it's become, and since then, this has become like folklore. It's, although it's, it's, it's not a law, it's, it's an unproven hypothesis, but it becomes so much part of the background, it's now referred to as the uh, richardson obukov law. In fact, it's not a law, it's just a kind of hypothesis. The other thing I wish to emphasize is that this uh, theory, and it is a theory, is valid for asymptotically almost infinite Reynolds number, that is for very large inertial subrange. Now how large the inertial subrange has to be is still an open question, it's just very large. Uh, let's leave it like that for the moment. Now this is uh, how things stand at the moment, and since 1926, nearly for 100 years, this has gone more or less unchallenged, and more or less every theory of pair diffusion is based around this idea of locality, that is till now, and so let's now uh, look at it again. So I'm going to, I've revisited this whole I idea recently. Uh, I've got a new picture coming up, and let's start with the 1926 data set again. Now what I note, first of all, for a long time, and I think everybody thought the four thirds that uh, Richardson drew was actually a best fit. That is not a best fit, it's just a guess. The best fit, if you do all seven points, is actually 1.2. Four, eight, which is the uh, which is the red line. So that's a little bit. Of, and in fact, uh, Richardson and Sturmer later on did note that uh, you could really have any power between 1.3 and 1.5. And of course, there's a lot of error 
associated with in the sense that these data pods are from different sources, there's lots of buoyancy in the atmosphere and so on. So this power law is at best an approximation. Furthermore, I know to, I, I don't know, if you look at this point here, if you go back to the original paper, this comes from molecular diffusion experiments. It's got nothing to do with turbulence at all. It's laminar flow. It's in fact a molecular diffusion. So I thought, well, let's remove this point. It's an outlier. Forget that. Let's see what happens. And, and all of a sudden, this happens, the black line. So these six points, and these fall nearly on, it's nearly a perfect fit, except for this point. And you get a slope of 1.567, which is actually beyond even what Richard and Stomel suggested. So at this point, we then are entitled to ask, well, is it really a, f a locality? This seems to suggest something beyond locality. So at the very least, uh, what it suggests is that at least locality is not necessarily the best model, and there's certainly room for new thinking in this field. And what about um, other evidence? Uh, there have been lots of observations, tracking experiments, DNS. The problem with all of them is either that the errors are too large. For example, Tatarsky, 1960, he observed comets, tails in the atmosphere, but the errors are just too large to be decisive. And other things like measurements in the lake, the quasi two dimensional approximations. And the problem with tracking experiments in DNS is that we can not get a large inertia subrange. The best the DNS, the best that DNS can do to date is maybe one or two orders of magnitude, but we need really much larger than that. So in other words, uh, things are still, uh, we've progressed not much further than 1926, and it culminates in this very famous statement by Salazar and Collins, 2011, that there has not been an experiment that has unequivocally confirmed the richardson obikov scaling over a broad enough range of time and with sufficient accuracy. So the summary of all this so far is that there is room for new thinking, and, and I will hope to persuade you that there is, in fact, an alternative theory. And I'm going to, therefore, approach this whole subject from first principles. And in particular, I'm going to retain some of these ideas, some of uh, the ones, the bits I'm going to, uh, the, the, the assumptions I'm going to retain are that it's nearly infinite Reynolds number. That means very large in a subrange. We retain the hypothesis, Richardson's two hypotheses of scale-dependent pair diffusion and a single power scaling. But I want to generalize the uh, spectrum, not just to K minus 5 thirds, because I want to see what happens when we have, for example, intermittency corrections, because we know that in uh, 1962, Komogoro himself corrected the minus 5 thirds to a correction to take into account intermittency. And I would like, and unlike uh, the original work, I want to a little bit more rigorous than just plain um, scaling arguments. See if you can, I'm going to adopt uh, the method of Fourier decomposing the relative velocity itself. And we know this, this is the sort of uh, bachelor argument, bachelor, the Fourier decomposition of velocity. I do now, I now look at the relative velocity to, of, two, of two particles here, and I decompose this also in Fourier component. If you take the scalar product of this with L, L dot V, and take the ensemble average, this then becomes, uh, this of course is the, actually the definition of the pair diffusion itself. And homogeneity means we can integrate also overall space, so effectively get rid of this X1 dependence. And we need a closure hypothesis so that we can uh, uh, repose this in terms of L squared and the uh, average of AK and so on. Alpha, beta are the, uh, are the angles between these, these vectors. And now we appeal to isotropy, so we integrate over shells so that we can effectively get rid of the alpha and beta uh, dependencies. And finally, we therefore get, obtain a form for the pair diffusion directly as integral K is now the modulus of the wave number. And uh, where do we go from? So now we make the, the central physical hypothesis of this uh, new formulation is that we assume the existence of a local neighborhood. And I, let me write this down. The, the idea is, is now, is this, that we have a pair diffusion size L. And let's associate a wave number with this. And I assume, in, in physical space, there's some kind of neighborhood. 
called the local, local neighbor. Outside of this is non-local. In wave number space, this amounts to saying, let's say the pair diffusion is here, KL. And so in other words, this is the locality, local neighborhood associated with that separation. This is the non-local neighborhood. And this is what, it, in other words, we can repose this integral as a sum of two parts. One is the local, comes from the local neighborhood here, and this is the rest. In other words, the local, the local neighborhood consists of those wave numbers which are less than, well, K star is this here, I should put here. It's an arbitrary, it's an arbitrary size. That's not, for scaling purposes, it's not important to determine K star, although if you want to measure it, you'll have to make some kind of, oops. Where are we? Here. So here it is. So this is your L. This is K star, which is the designation between local and non-local uh, neighborhoods. And this allows us to pose the pair diffusion as a sum of two parts, local and non-local parts. And the only thing we need now is a form for the energy spectrum itself, which I said we can use a generalized uh, K minus P. And we look at the range between P equals 1 and 3 and over a wave number range, say k1 to k eta. And this then allows us to explicitly write the pair diffusivity in this form. And then after a bit of, and it's a little bit of algebra, it's not important, but the important thing is that when you work all this out, put in k minus p in here, we obtain this, that the pair diffusivity is the sum of two, essentially two processes, a, lo a local and a non-local one. And indeed, when you work this out, you'll get that the, that the local power range is the correct locality scaling. So when you put P equals 5 thirds, we get 4 thirds as we got from Richardson. But then there's a second component. And this also shows what Richardson's hypothesis amounted to. It amounted to basically ignoring this a priori from the beginning. And the difference really is that I haven't, about, I haven't ignored this from the beginning. So this shows very clearly that, we, uh, that, that, that the pair diffusion process is the sum of two uh, local and a non-local process. Uh, the non-local power law is always two. Okay? So, what about the other, the second Richardson hypothesis of a single power law? If we now say that KL is a single power law, in fact, we get this. So that uh, the manifestation of the pair diffusion as a single power means that this must lie in between the two asymptotic limits. So in other words, gamma p is between the local, the local exponent, uh, local power law and the purely non-local. So in other words, it's between 1 plus p over 2 and 2. So this is actually the main outcome of this theory. And we can obtain some specific results as follows. That is that um, if we were to, say, in a simulation, go from p equals 1, which is the pure local limit, we would get sigma 1 to the power of 1. And in the opposite, which is the non-local limit, we get sigma 2. And then we'd see a smooth, and we would see a smooth transition between them as single power laws. In particular, for the Kolmogorov 5 thirds, we would see that the power law is bigger than 4 thirds, but less than 2. This is the basic, this is the basic result. And if we all, and, but if we look at the Komogor uh, with intermittency, which is say about 1.74, we would note that the power is much greater than four thirds, but still less than two. It's as far as we can go with theory to get an exact, precise f numbers for gamma p. We have to do experiments or simulations, but this is the uh, main result of the theory so far. And finally, if we can go to, we can actually convert this into a. Uh, generalized uh, Kolmogorov, uh, Obukov hypothesis. That, uh, no, so, this, so this is equivalent, say, to uh, the mean squared separation to some power chi. Now, note that the um, gamma p. If you look at the pure local local, local theory, then gamma is um, linear in p. That means small changes in p produces small changes in gamma. But chi is actually nonlinear, so we can expect bigger changes there. In particular, if you look at p equals 1.74, we get the difference between three is, is quite large. And of course, a qu key question is, uh, this is, this is only purely on the locality theory. What will the non-local theory give us? So that's a question we need to address through simulations. So 
this is the theory. What we now move on to simulations. Um, the problem, as I said, is that DNS is out of the question many decades away. So we look at a, a kind of Lagrangian model, kinematic simulations, which is basically a Fourier series with the uh, amplitude proportional to the energy spectrum in this form. And we can also have an unsteadiness here. That's not so important at the moment. Let me skip that. However, one limitation, it's not dynamical, so there is some, but it has the advantage that uh, it can generate very large inertial subrange, which is suitable for our purposes. It's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, the nearest thing we've got at the moment. So let's see what happens. And of course, uh, we can integrate the, what, what we do in KS, we actually generate entire uh, trajectories by integrating the flow field through any suitable method, Ranga Kata, Adams, Bashford, whatever. And we harvest this. The randomness in KS comes from choosing many different fields, and the directions are chosen isotropically in each different field, so that we get an ensemble, and then we can do statistics on this. And the nice thing about KS is that the energy spectrum can be made uh, arbitrary. Uh, now, ideally, we would like to get this kind of spectrum, k to the 4 for small and 5 thirds or minus p for large. But in fact, uh, we do a trick here that for uh, we know that uh, for very large scales, do nothing but sweep. So we don't actually need the large scale spectrum. So we can actually simply zero this in here. So we, all we need to do is to generate a very large inertial range spectrum, and off we go. I'm going to stick to 10 to the 6. Seems to be reasonably good. That's the maximum we can do at the moment. And uh, let me go on to, uh, let me just say it's been validated in the past in 1999. Uh, am I doing for time? Let me... Yeah, so 1999, we published this paper comparing KS with the available DNS at the time. It was very, quite good result, very good matching. And in fact, uh, we even got the fourth order flatness to be very well matched, although KS is not actually specifically defined, designed for this. So that was reasonably good. Although this was for the low runners number, I have to say. This was... Uh, Anyway, so let's get on to the results. So we've used KS to generate uh, a large uh, inertial range, and we looked at trajectories, and these are the sort of key components. So we look at 10 to the inertial range of 10 to the 6. We use about 200 modes, 5,000 flow fields, eight pairs of particles per realization, about 40,000 trajectories, which is the largest uh, ensemble I've ever come across so far to date. They're using fourth order adams bashforth method, fixed time step, and so on and uh, these supercomputers. So let me just give you the results. Main result is here. And if we note this, this is exactly as predicted by the theory. If we go back, for example, where is it? Where is the theory? Ah, here. See here? This was the theory to prediction. It was go from one to two with a smooth transition all the way through. That was the theory. This is the result from KS, which more or less exactly matches the theory. We, go for, we can't go to P equals 1, but that's a singular limit. We, we can get close to it, though. It goes roughly from 1 to 2. And this is the same thing on the right, except compensated by uh, whatever the power. So that it's flat wherever the power. In fact, that's how we obtain the power. So wherever it's flat, that's the value of gamma we take. And this summarizes the result. The blue dashed line is what we would expect to get from pure locality scaling. And the black dots are the ones that we actually did. And the ratio between the two is uh, on the right, this is the cyan line. And the maximum deviation is roughly where you'd expect Kolmogorov things. In particular, for the Kolmogorov case, 5 thirds, we get the scaling of 1.53, which, which is already larger than the 4 thirds, Richardson. And with intermittency 1.74, we get 1.57. Now, this is almost exactly the same as the 1926 revised data. I think the closest is so close, I have to say I'm a little bit cautious. There is so much error that I think it's a little bit coincidental, even if I say so myself. So I wouldn't read too much into how close these two things are. But nevertheless, it is, it, it, it's, it's interesting. It's remarkably good agreement. And at least it suggests that the theory is, is reasonably uh, plausible. OK. And finally, the uh, generalized Obukov. We can convert this. And this is uh, the blue line is the, again, locality. And this is the obtained symbol. This is the right is the same, except we're looking at a smaller unit. And indeed, Komogorov, 
we get 4.21, which is already much larger than, I said that the, it's much more sensitive, it's nonlinear, so it's much more sensitive. And indeed, for the intermittency case, we get 4.65, which is much larger than T cubed. Okay? So, so the summary of the theory so far and is, is this that the, the limit of asymptotically large inertial subranges, we obtain this from uh, theory and simulation, combination theory and simulation. And it's been observed both in 1926 revised data and kinematic simulations. And just as a note, that if we assume that the integral length scale is, you know, take an ad hoc value, 10 times larger than the uh, largest inertial range, then we get roughly a minimum Reynolds number of about 10 to the 9, which is why you cannot do experiments in DNS at this moment in time. We have to look, rely on observations in the atmosphere if we can get a hold of them. So this is huge. We're talking about geophysical turbulence and larger. So finally, uh, take home messages. Let's repeat. Uh, Non-local theory has been developed for pair diffusion. We've seen that it's governed by local and crucially non-local processes. At the heart is this. The main physical hypothesis is this, that the, we assume the existence of a local neighborhood and non-local neighborhoods. Both of them are significant. This is the specific results obtained, repeats the previous uh, slide. But a word of caution, still only a hypothesis. Kinematic simulations is not dynamical, it's not perfect. But so we still need experiments and or DNS one day to validate all this. But I think perhaps the most interesting thing is the last one that excites new thinking. Whatever you say, it's, there is new thinking and new methods as well. And it must have implications for general theory of turbulence, I think. In fact, uh, I haven't mentioned this here, but I've already extended this to inertial particles in the Stokes' trial. I've got a poster out here, so you're invited to come and look at the poster. And that also needs to be modified. So I think uh, this is, to me, the most interesting, most exciting part of this research. Is it does actually offer a new kind of way of thinking of, uh, for pair diffusion and for the general theory of turbulence. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.